Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Welcome back to the channel and I hope you're all doing well. Nvidia at the start of this month released their long anticipated RTX 3000 series of graphics cards and impressed everyone with the enormous performance leaps these cards are bringing and the amazing price to performance ratio they offer. With all the cards in the stack from the RTX 3070 all the way to the top dog RTX 3090 offering performance greater than the 2080 Ti, yeah, they put on quite the show. If you're interested in coverage of the initial launch, definitely check out my video where we go over all the details and all the specifications for the new graphics cards. Link for that video will be down below. So in this video, what I wanted to do was focus on the new details Nvidia just unveiled regarding these new graphics cards and some of the new features and technologies they're introducing with the Ampere architecture. On the 2nd of September, Nvidia held a Q&A over at the Nvidia subreddit, addressing some of the most asked questions and biggest concerns within the PC hardware community surrounding the RTX 3000 series graphics cards. I'll leave a link to this Q&A down below so you guys can read all the information that was given out. Since there was actually a lot of content and surprisingly the answers were quite thorough. So we're going to be going over some of that information as I feel like it's very important to get out there since I know so many folks were concerned and had legitimate questions about the cards. And I also am very appreciative of Nvidia's community manager for addressing all of it in the Q&A. And I believe this kind of communication only further helps to facilitate sales of your products. Starting off, the first question they address is, why does the RTX 3080 only have 10GB of memory and why they thought that it might be appropriate considering in some cases that's a downgrade, i.e. RTX 2080 Ti, GTX 1080 Ti. Now, this was also one of the major concerns for me as well. Since with Turing, aside from abysmal performance improvements, we never saw any of the successor's SKUs get memory upgrades either. So I was hoping to see some substantial upgrades in this regard too, rather than the 10 and 8GB configurations we saw for the 3080 and 3070 respectively. I mean, we have the RTX 3090 with that massive 24GB memory buffer, but that was more of a Titan RTX replacement, which also had 24 gigabytes of VRAM. Nonetheless, for their mainstream products, I was hoping we would have gotten something like 16 gigabytes for the 3080 and 12 gigabytes or 10 gigabytes at least for the 3070. Their answer to this question was that memory configurations are greatly dependent on the trend of current most popular and demanding games. Games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Metro Exodus, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and more. Along with that, they worked with developers to ask them their opinions on what would be the most sufficient for their needs. Their target being 4K gaming for the 3080, they said that when games are running at that resolution with an FPS range of around 60 to 100 FPS, you'll often see VRAM usage in the neighborhood of around 6 to 8 gigabytes. So in order to maintain that best value of the card while delivering sufficient capabilities, they felt like 10 gigabytes was good enough. Now what I'll say about that is, yeah, they're absolutely right. Increasing VRAM amount does increase the cost of the card, and I'm not exactly sure on what's the price for a single stack of G6X memory, but it's not just that, then they'd have to increase memory bus, design a larger controller, overall cost just would have been higher. Nonetheless, as I've mentioned before, 10 gigabytes should be sufficient enough for the duration of the card's life and until Ampere will remain relevant. Alright, so the next question was to clarify what exactly they meant when on the generational leap slide they state that the RTX 3070 will be faster than a 2080 Ti. Does this include traditional rasterization performance or do they just mean it will be faster when ray tracing and DLSS are enabled? And they actually mean both are included, so games that only rely on traditional rasterization performance, you should expect the 3070 to be faster than the 2080 Ti and with games that support DXR and DLSS, the performance there should be better too. Thanks to improved RT cores and faster tensor cores for DLSS performance. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that while Nvidia is claiming faster performance, we don't know exactly by how much. I'm expecting the 3070 to be about 5% faster than the 2080 Ti on average across the board, but nothing too drastic than that. That would still be, you know, excellent. And remember, the 3070 has an MSRP of 499, which is less than half the price of the 2080 Ti's founder 2080 Ti Founders Edition card. So the price to performance here is absolutely fantastic. The next question was in regards to HDMI 2.1 and in extension if there will be support for 10-bit 444 chroma subsampling at 120 Hz. 
Starting with the former, they had confirmed that new GPUs would be coming with HDMI 2.1, but it wasn't clear if they had supported the full theoretical bandwidth at 48 gigabits per second. Now they have confirmed that you know, these cards will have the full HDMI 2.1 bandwidth support. This is excellent as my LG C9 OLED TV has HDMI 2.1 48 gigabit per second ports. Not that it needs it, 40 gigabits per second would be sufficient to fully drive that 10 bit panel at 4K HDR, hence why LG downgraded the ports with their new CX model. Nonetheless, it's great that they're giving that clarification. As for the capability of 444 chroma subsampling, they also mentioned how all the cards in the Ampere lineup will have the capability to do so at 10 bit and can even do it at 8K with 12 uh, bit HDR. So, this was very satisfying to hear as currently my 2080 Super can only run. 444 at 8-bit due to the HDMI 2.0 limitations. This ensures I'll be able to see all those great visual details and get the full uh, visual quality out of my uh, display panel. Let's move on to the next question which pertains to the doubling of the CUDA cores. When Nvidia unveiled the specs of the RTX 3000 series, many were surprised to see the amount of CUDA cores all the cards were packing. These numbers were just unheard of and so many were wondering how in the world they could have achieved such a feat with Ampere. And Tony Tomasi actually gives a very thorough explanation of it, so I'll read you guys what he had to say. One of the key design goals for the Ampere 30 series SM was to achieve twice the throughput for FP32 operations compared to the Turing SM. To accomplish this goal, the Ampere SM includes new data path designs for FP32 and INT32 operations. One data path in each partition consists of 16 FP32 CUDA cores capable of executing 16 FP32 operations per clock. Another data path consists of both 16 FP32 CUDA cores and 16 INT32 cores. As a result of this new design, each Ampere SM partition is capable of executing either 32 FP32 operations per clock or 16 FP32 and 16 INT32 operations per clock. All four SM partitions combined can execute 128 FP32 operations per clock, which is double the FP32 rate of the Turing SM, or 64 FP32 and 64 INT32 operations per clock. Doubling the processing speed for FP32 improves performance for a number of common graphics and compute operations and algorithms. Modern shader workloads typically have a mixture of FP32 arithmetic instructions such as FFMA, floating point additions, or floating point multiplications, combined with simpler instructions such as integer adds for addressing and fetching data, floating point compare, or min-max for processing results, etc. Performance gains will vary at the shader and application level depending on the mix of instructions. Ray tracing denoising shaders are good examples that might benefit greatly from the doubling of FP32 throughput. Doubling math throughput required doubling the data path supporting it, which is why the Ampere SM also doubled the shared memory and L1 cache performance for the SM. Total L1 bandwidth for GeForce RTX 3080 is 219 gigabytes per second versus 116 gigabytes per second for the RTX 2080 Super. Like prior Nvidia GPUs, Ampere is composed of graphics processing clusters (GPCs), texture processing cl clusters (TPCs), streaming multiprocessors (SMs), raster operators (ROPs), and memory controllers. The GPC is the dominant high-level hardware block with all the key graphics processing units residing inside the GPC. Each GPC includes a dedicated raster engine and now also includes two ROP partitions, which is a new feature for the Nvidia Ampere architecture GPUs. More detail on the NVIDIA Ampere architecture can be found in NVIDIA's Ampere architecture white paper, which will be republished in the coming days. So, if you're interested in the deep dive of the Ampere architecture, I highly recommend reading the Ampere white paper once it's out, as it looks like they've done quite a bit of changes here, and, you know, for the better hopefully, which definitely should help improve performance. Moving on, and we have some discussion in regards to DLSS, which is deep learning super sampling. As you all know, DLSS is an absolute game changer. Thanks to AI and the help of the powerful tensor cores, you're able to essentially play games at higher resolutions without having a huge hit to your performance. In fact, it boosts performance greatly. This is due to the fact that it can actually render the game at a lower internal resolution, then use DLSS to intelligently upscale the image to retain that great sharpness of the higher resolution, as if you were playing at 4K or 8K, but at the same time, give you the same performance as if you were playing at, say, 1080p. Now, when NVIDIA came out with DLSS back when Turing launched, 
It was disregarded as a feature that you should ignore simply because it didn't work that well and image quality suffered. But with DLSS 2.0, they had actually made drastic improvements with the technology and works like how I explained earlier. Now, people were expecting them to come out with another update like DLSS 3.0 or something like DLSS 2.1, for which they state that the DLSS 2.1 SDK is already out and includes three updates, the first being an ultra performance mode for 8K gaming, which delivers 8K gaming on the RTX 3090 with a 9x resolution scaling option. And they actually had shown another chart which shows some insane performance figures for the RTX 3090 with high graphics at 8K with ray tracing enabled and DLSS on. And you can see the impressive performance boost from DLSS, where in a game like Control, the average FPS goes from 8 all the way to 57, which is basically unplayable to a smooth playable experience. Same thing with games like Death Stranding, you go from 32 FPS to 78 FPS. Now what's also really interesting about this chart is that they also so show some games which don't even support DLSS. But it doesn't matter, as in games like Rainbow Six Siege, Rocket League, Forza Horizon 4, the 3090 gets well above 60 FPS at 8K, and that's just absolutely crazy. I actually, you know, am leaning more towards the 3090 over the 3080 after seeing these charts the more and more I look at them, but we'll have to see what I can get my hands on first. But man, what I absolutely love to enjoy those games at 8K and at that smooth experience too. In addition to all that, they also mentioned that DLSS will work with VR now. So this is also huge, as I know with VR, in order to reduce and mitigate motion sickness and to have a really, really smooth playable experience, you need to make sure your frame rates are high and consistent. So with DLSS, you should be able to ensure that. Finally, they mentioned that dynamic resolution support will also be included, which will allow DLSS to change dimensions from frame to frame with the output size which remains fixed, so that's actually a bit interesting. Depending on the parameters there, it can probably further optimize itself and thus boost performance. Moving along, there's some questions surrounding the RTX IO technology, which works off of Microsoft's direct storage tech, essentially allowing the GPU to leverage fast SSD storage devices, like RAM to load up information and therefore help reduce rendering workload times and decrease loading times. It's not a replacement for VRAM, but it will definitely allow data from the SSD to get to the GPU and GPU memory faster with less CPU overhead. Now the positive merits of this feature still remain to be seen as there aren't any games out there that have implemented it, so we don't know for sure how much it can improve per performance and what kind of benefits we'll see in regards to say world asset loading. Nonetheless, I'm happy to see that they are working on some solutions which can help leverage and use the SSDs to their full potential. Now, of the biggest concerns among users who are interested in this tech is whether or not there is an SSD speed or specification requirement. They respond that there is no SSD speed requirement for RTX IO to work, but they do state the faster the SSD, the higher the performance results will be. Say for example, a Gen 4 NVMe SSD should see greater results over a regular 2.5 inch SATA based SSD. Regardless of how fast the SSD is though, you'll still see the benefit because RTX IO will offload those decompression and compression assets to the GPU from your CPU cores, reducing lots of overhead and also reducing IO operations. They also mention how compression ratios are typically 2 to 1, so that would amplify the read performance of any SSD by 2 times. So theoretically, if you have say an NVMe SSD with a read of around 3000 megabytes per second, now you're looking at a whopping 6,000 megabytes per second. So this tech is actually very similar to what we saw with the PS5. And, you know, it definitely got a lot of people excited because it seems very promising. And, you know, from a development standpoint, you know, it looks like they can build worlds that are so lifelike and expansive worlds. And we should definitely see this performance and these technologies facilitating that growth. One of the last things I want to go over, which I also think is very important, is that many users were concerned if there would be any performance degradations between using these RTX 3000 series GPUs on a platform that supports PCIe 4.0 versus 3.0 and if the extra bandwidth provided by the newer interface can boost performance. And you can rest easy as they state that the impact is typically less than a few percent going from X16 PCIe 4.0 to X16 PCIe 3.0. And that is true. I've seen many benchmarks where even a 2080 Ti overclocked doesn't even saturate the full bandwidth capabilities of X16 PCIe 3.0.
Of course, these new RTX 3000 series GPUs are faster, so we won't know for sure until they're actually in reviewers' hands for testing. But more importantly, you should choose a CPU that won't bottleneck the GPUs. And well, if you're going to be playing at high resolutions like 1440p, 4K, or you know even 8K, since now that's a thing, you're still going to be 95% GPU bottlenecked. I still think that you know Intel messed up by not supporting PCIe 4.0 with their Comet-like platform because. What about other features like RTX IO? Intel users will only be limited to using the tech with Gen 3 NVMEs and who knows how much performance can decrease there. So I actually can't wait until these cards and those features are out because there will be so much testing to do and I absolutely love analyzing this kind of stuff. Well, that was pretty much all the information I wanted to cover in this video. There was some more information in the Q&A which you guys can read for yourselves if you wish to do so. I just want to share and talk about the stuff that interested me the most. But I do have another video upcoming where we'll analyze the performance of the RTX 3080 from the demos we've seen so far and extrapolate its performance as I currently have an RTX 2080 in my test system. So that'll be a fun little video and if you're interested, definitely stay tuned for it. Subscribe and click the bell icon so you guys never miss another one of those videos. Leave your comments down below, check out the video description for my other videos and ways to support the channel. Take care guys and I'll see you in the next one.